Welcome everyone. I'm Jordana Gessler, Vice President of Education and Exhibits at Holocaust Museum LA, the first and oldest survivor founded Holocaust Museum in the United States. We were founded in 1961 by a group of Holocaust survivors who wanted to create a safe place to display their precious artifacts, to remember their family members and loved ones who had perished and to educate future generations on the important lessons of the Holocaust. Today, the museum continues to provide free Holocaust education to students from across Los Angeles, the United States and the world, fulfilling the mission of our founding survivors to commemorate, educate and inspire. Thank you for joining us for today's program, Remembering Kristallnacht. During the night of November 9th, 1938, a state-sponsored violent anti-Jewish pogrom broke out across Germany and its incorporated territories, including Austria. Nazi officials concealed the organized nature of the attack in which mobs desecrated synagogues, vandalized Jewish-owned businesses and homes, murdered around 100 Jews, and sent 30,000 Jewish men to concentration camps that evening, which was the single largest mass arrestation of German Jews in Holocaust history. As a nationwide brutal mass attack on Jews simply based on their identity, Kristallnacht was a significant turning point in Holocaust history. Today, we are honored to hear from an excellent panel and host a conversation which will be poignant and informative. We will first hear from Dr. Alan Steinweiss, who will share a brief history of Kristallnacht and set the historical context. We will then hear from an eyewitness uh, uh, from a Holocaust survivor, Paul Kester, who experienced Kristallnacht firsthand. And finally, from Stefan Schneider, from the German Consul General in Los Angeles on the significance of Kristallnacht for modern Germany. Dr. Alan Steinweiss is a professor of history and the Raul Hilberg Distinguished Professor of Holocaust Studies at the University of Vermont. He has been a Fulbright professor and has authored several books, including Kristallnacht 1938. Paul Kester was born in 1925 in Wiesbaden, Germany. After Kristallnacht, his family arranged for him to escape on a kinder transport to Sweden in early 1939. Stefan Schneider is the Consul General for the Federal Republic of Germany in Los Angeles and has over three decades of distinguished diplomatic service. Before we get started, please note that you will have the opportunity to ask questions at the end of the program. You can ask a question at any time during the program by typing it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. It is now my pleasure to hand the mic over to Dr. Alan Steinweiss. Uh, thanks very much, Jordana, uh, and uh, thanks to you and the museum for organizing this event. I'm honored to be uh, participating, uh, especially uh, in such distinguished uh, company. Uh, what I'd like to do is just in a few minutes, uh, review some of the key historical uh, points uh, about uh, the uh, 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 Kristallnacht, uh, some of them drawn from uh, my own research on the subject and some uh, drawn from uh, the research uh, of, uh, of others. And I've kind of arranged this just as a series of uh, bullet points uh, just for the sake of, um, uh, of time. Uh, first, uh, the Kristallnacht, uh, which uh, Germans prefer to call the November pogrom, uh, was the single uh, large-scale incidence of violence uh, against Jews in Germany before the outbreak of the Second World uh, War. Uh, previously, uh, from 1933, from the Nazi seizure of power onward, uh, anti-Jewish measures had uh, predominantly been uh, legal, uh, and bureaucratic uh, in nature. There had been uh, sporadic violence against Jews in Germany, uh, uh, sometimes uh, temporary waves of violence uh, lasting uh, a few days at a time, uh, focusing very often on uh, specific communities. I don't wanna minimize uh, the importance uh, of uh, uh, the violence that took place between 1933 and 1938. And perhaps Mr. Kester would wanna say more about what he experienced. Uh, but the point is that uh, all of that that had come before paled in comparison with this gigantic orgy of violence that took place uh, in November uh, 1938 on Kristallnacht. Uh, 
Uh, second, uh, just to review the extent of the damage, uh, most of the country's synagogues were destroyed or severely damaged. Uh, thousands of Jewish owned shops were vandalized and plundered. So people didn't only destroy, they also stole a lot of stuff. Uh, Jewish institutions were attacked, uh, schools, hospitals, retirement homes. Something very important that is often overlooked is that Jewish homes were invaded. You know, gangs of rioters just broke into Jewish homes and apartments, terrorized the occupants, uh, beat people up, and so forth. Uh, Jordana mentioned that uh, 91 people, 91 Jews were killed. That was the official death toll. Uh, it's, that, that number is probably an underestimate. Uh, we don't really know what the exact number was. It was probably two or three times that many. And if you count uh, Jews who uh, succumbed to suicide as a result of the violence or who died uh, in uh, concentration camps in subsequent weeks, uh, because one of the things that happened uh, in the days immediately subsequent to the uh, pogrom was that uh, 30,000, as Jordana mentioned, 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and uh, sent to uh, uh, concentration camps. And, uh, you know, there were, there were uh, Jews who died under those circumstances uh, as well. Um, uh, when Jordana, uh, uh, in her introduction, she mentioned that uh, the, uh, the, the Kristallnacht had been organized, and it was organized, but I think it's important to emphasize that it was organized uh, on very short notice. That is to say, it was not planned well in advance. It was organized really on a, a few hours notice. Uh, the actual uh, decision to um, uh, initiate uh, the pogrom was made by Hitler uh, during the day. Uh, we have very good documentation for this during the day on uh, uh, November 9th. Uh, that was the day that this German diplomat uh, who had been shot in Paris two days earlier by a, 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 a Jewish teenager, uh, Herschel Grunspan, November 9th is the day uh, that he died. And at that point, um, Hitler, upon the urging of Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister, uh, uh, authorized uh, the Kristallnacht. There, had, there was no plan in advance to do anything like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a notable feature of the Kristallnacht that you could organize something like that on very short notice and still get tens of thousands of Nazis and other Germans to engage in acts of violence against uh, uh, against Jews, I think the, you know, the the argument that it wasn't organized well, that, that it wasn't planned in advance, uh, is actually in some ways, if you think about it, uh, a more serious indictment of German society, uh, because you know, at the drop of a hat, basically, uh, all of this violence uh, took place. Uh, a wide spe spectrum of Germans participated in the violence. Uh, the core of the rioters were the stormtroopers, uh, the members of the SA, the brown shirts, even though they had been ordered not to wear their uniforms while this was happening. Uh, uh, it's also important to note, however, that there were uh, many other uh, uh, categories of uh, of Germans who participated. A very important one, for example, was the Hitler Youth. A lot of teenagers uh, participated. The, 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 the pogrom started late at night on November 9th, but continued uh, in, well into the next day on November 10th in daylight. That was a school day. Teachers who were Nazis, and many teachers were also kind of like leaders of the local you know, Hitler Youth group you know, took their students down to the synagogue and had them throw stones at it and so forth. So there was fairly widespread uh, participation by uh, young people, which is something that's often overlooked. Uh, uh, there was a kind of gendered uh, division of labor. The, the actual uh, acts of violence were perpetrated 
primarily by men and uh, teenage boys. Uh, women participated as well uh, in most cases as looters. That is to say that when Jewish shops were vandalized or Jewish homes were invaded, uh, it was very often women who were involved in the looting of Jewish owned uh, uh, property. Uh, turning to the, uh, uh, now, now there's another side to that uh, when, when, when considering the uh, uh, conduct of the uh, German population during the pogrom, uh, and that is that many in, there were many instances of Jews receiving help uh, from uh, non-Jewish uh, friends and neighbors. Uh, Jews were often able to find refuge in the homes. You know, they the rioters very often knew where the Jews lived, so they fled to some neighbor's house and were sheltered there. Sometimes uh, Jewish. Uh, non-Jewish uh, neighbors or just passers-by uh, defended Jews from uh, physical assault uh, or after the pogrom was over and Jews were cleaning up their vandalized property, uh, non-Jewish neighbors uh, uh, tried, to, tried to help. That was not universal. Uh, uh, this help from non-Jews was more common in some communities than in others. Uh, I believe it was most common in Berlin because of the high degree to which the Jewish population was integrated into the mainstream of society there. That's perhaps also something that the professor would want to address with respect to his personal experience uh, in Wiesbaden. Just a couple more points and then I'll turn it over. Uh, Jews, uh, the Jews themselves were not passive uh, in the face of this violence. Uh, to the extent that it was possible, uh, they defended, they fled, as I mentioned, uh, you know, sometimes with the help of uh, non-Jewish neighbors. They defended themselves, uh, fought back uh, if they were being uh, physically uh, uh, assaulted. Um, and finally, uh, just to address the um, the, the term Kristallnacht, um, it means uh, in, uh, it's the German term for crystal night and is often uh, translated into English as night of broken glass, that uh, the broken glass being a reference to the, uh, the windows of Jewish shops that were shattered and the, 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 those Schaufenster, those um, uh, show windows in shops were made of a special kind of glass that when it was, it didn't shatter into shards, but broke into a thousand little uh, pieces of uh, crystal and that, that glass uh, lined the streets. Uh, the, the problem with the term Kristallnacht is the word, or night of broken glass, is the word night. Uh, it was not a night, uh, but rather, or it was not a single night, but rather it was a prolonged event um, the violence really began on November 7th, on the day of the assassination in Paris of that German diplomat, which ended up being the pretext for the, for the pogrom. There were uh, uh, anti-Jewish riots already uh, on the evening and night of uh, November 7th. They continued on November 8th. Those riots re reached a crescendo on a kind of national level on the 9th of uh, November. And then they continue into daylight in many places on November 10th. So, you know, we often think of the violence occurring under cover of darkness, but, you know, it happened in broad daylight uh, in a lot of uh, places as well. And then the mass arrests of Jews, of the 30,000 Jews who were arrested and sent to the camps, those really begin on the 10th of November and continue for a few days. And then for the Jews, for those 30,000 Jewish men who were sent to the camps, they're in the camps for, in some cases, days, in some cases, weeks, and in some cases, months, in most cases, weeks. And of course, uh, that was also a, hor a horrific experience, right? So when you look, when you study the uh, personal testimonies of Jews who lived through this, especially the ones who went to the camps, they don't talk about one terrible night, but they talk about really a prolonged period 
during which uh, they were subjected to uh, uh, violence and uh, psychological terror. So I'll end there. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more that one can say, but uh, if there are questions, I'm happy to take them later. Thank you so much, Alan, for setting the historical context for us and really, I'm sure, taking so much knowledge that you have on the event and really distilling it to something um, that we can hear and set the stage for. We really appreciate it. Um, and now I would love to hand the mic over, so to speak, to Paul Kester, who will share some of his personal experience as a German Jew who witnessed um, Kristallnacht. I remember the 10th of November and the weeks that followed. I remember it as if it had happened yesterday. On the 10th of November, I went to school as always a German gymnasium in Wiesbaden with my friend Leo, not realizing that anything was happening. The walk to the school through a um, middle-class residential area showed no signs of anything that maybe was starting to happen in other parts of town. School started in its normal fashion, but around 10 o'clock, an administrator of the school came to the class. Leo and I were the only two Jewish students in a class of 35, and told Leo and me, we should go home, that there were problems in town. Well, we followed instructions. I got home. I found my mother and my grandmother who lived with us, visibly upset. They had started earlier to go to our store. We had a large clothing store in the center of town. And to get there, they had to pass the large synagogue in Wiesbaden. And they saw it in flames. And they also saw some Jewish stores being vandalized and destroyed. So they went home and not knowing what to do. My father had gone earlier to open the store around eight o'clock in the morning. He found a large crowd in front of our store. The store had 10 display windows and other glass display cases. And there was a large crowd in front of the store, very busy, shattering and smashing whatever they could. And it certainly qualified as Dr. Stein was mentioned as Crystal Macht, or for, in our case, Crystal Day, because all that many, that enormous amount of glass displays and windows was the population was busy smashing it to pieces. Anyhow, my father got there, tried to get through a large crowd that was engaged in the destruction. Two policemen observed the event, did not interfere, but ordered my father to come with him. My father made a sideway move in the crowd and escaped, was hiding for a couple of days in the mountains outside Wiesbaden while the arrests of Jewish men went on. We quickly learned that all adult men between the ages of 16 and 65 were being arrested. We also quickly learned that this was not a Wiesbaden event, but that synagogues in all of Germany were burning, that remaining businesses that still existed were being smashed and destroyed, and that there was a, what we call a national pogrom going on that could not have been imagined ever to happen. 
Leo and I decided the next day to go back to school. We were promptly called to the principal's office and told that from now on, no Jewish children were allowed anymore to attend any German schools. That was the end of my German education. We went home and that day my father came back. Supposedly the arrests of men had stopped. But in the evening, the doorbell rings. We lived in an apartment building. It was about 8.30, 9 o'clock. I was at that time 12, almost 13 years old. I opened the door, a man in civilian clothing, identifies himself as a member of the German police, secret police, the field Gestapo, and orders my father to come with him. Within minutes, my father is gone. My mother says, my mother says, tells me, get on your bike and go to a friend's house, tell them the arrests are still going on. I remember riding that bike on a rainy November night, deeply disturbed and in shock of what was happening these days. My mother and I the next day go to the police, where's my father? No answer. Soon we find out a few days later that he had been sent to the concentration camp of Dachau. Other relatives wound up in Buchenwald and in a concentration camp near Berlin. The following days were busy for my mother and me. We had to clean up the mess in the store. It took us almost two weeks to gather the broken pieces. I was busy gathering broken glass for two weeks. I remember that I sometimes couldn't sleep at night because I had the noise of broken glass in my ears. And the overall atmosphere, I remember, was one of fear and despair and how can we get out? Obviously, this is the end. This is the beginning of the end of Jewish life in Germany and ultimately in Europe. But getting out was no problem. But where could you get in? No country would take you. The borders were closed. And then we learned that some countries would take children. England took 10,000. Western European countries took some. And my mother put me on the list for, of any of those countries to get me out. Already on December 7th, less than one month after the start of the pogrom, my friend Leo, I bid him farewell at the Central State Railroad Station in Wiesbaden. He was, he had relatives in Amsterdam. He got to Holland. I wished him well, and I was envious that I had to stay behind. A few days later, my father came back. I had seen some of the men coming back from the concentration camp. As a matter of fact, I had been asked to go to the, a few days earlier to go to the train station. Some men were supposed to come. And it is a picture that's still in my mind seeing about 20 men, uh, business people, lawyers, doctors, descending from a train coming from the concentration camp, a view to see these people emaciated, dirty, depressed, I could not, I barely could not recognize them in the condition they were in. Well, anyhow, a few days later, I was told my father's coming back. 
I was helping out with the Jewish community working. By the time I came here home, my father was cleaned up and he had always been in good physical condition. And uh, apparently withstood the hardship of Dachau uh, reasonably well. Next, what I remember was a letter from a distant relative in Sweden, a teacher at a Jewish boarding school. Sweden, the, uh, the Jewish, small Jewish community, declared its willingness to take 500 German Jewish children. And that boarding school was allocated 30 or 40 of those 500. And that teacher put my name on that list. And two days later, I get a letter from the Swedish embassy in Berlin that a visa was available for me that eliminated my name from any other list. And now it was clear that my destination, my destiny would be Sweden. This one I was getting close to Christmas. My father took me to visit relatives to say goodbye. Then my luggage had to be packed under the supervision of a German police to make sure that I would not take along anything newly acquired or anything of value. And on the 9th of January, exactly two months after the start of the pogrom, on the 9th of January, 1939, I bid my parents goodbye expressing the hope for a early reunion. And I take the train from Wiesbaden to Berlin, a seven hour ride, I'm alone. And I meet a cousin in Berlin, I stay with him. We go to the embassy, Swedish embassy the next day. It takes a couple of days of red tape. And I finally get the visa entered on my documents that I can travel to Sweden. On the 15th of January, 1939, I take the train from Berlin through Northern Germany to the Baltic Sea. I see an ocean for the first time. The train goes on a ferry. The ferry travels across the Baltic for about four hours to Sweden. My last memory of Germany is, I see the coastline slowly disappearing on this somewhat foggy January afternoon. And I remember I had a tremendous sense of relief, relief that I escaped from a country where now it was a crime to be Jewish. I made it to Sweden. It was the end of two months of traumatic and traumatic experiences for me. My childhood life as I had known it was terminated. A new chapter began for me I had escaped, I was lucky, but I still grieve for the many of my family, of so many kids I knew, youngsters, including my friend Leo, whom I had left behind. I was lucky and I treasured the life that I have lived ever since. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for allowing us to bear witness to this intense chapter of your life and for sharing your eyewitness account. Um, I'm sure there'll be many questions in the audience for you at the close of the program, but I will now turn it over to Consul General Stefan Schneider 
who will speak about the significance of Kristallnacht in modern Germany. Thank you very much, Jordana, and vielen Dank, Paul, for sharing your memory. Just let me, just before I, I start, to, to give, a, give some ideas about how we are uh, commemorating the so-called Kristallnacht, a term I, frankly speaking, do not like because it's not strong enough for what happened. But anyway, I just would like to share a story from my family. As you might know, some might know that I come from a Christian Jewish family myself. And from my mom's side, it's a Jewish side. And uh, she told me when she was the 9th of November, 1938, she was in Cologne. She lived in Cologne with my grandparents and she was 10 years old. And she passed near her school, she passed by a toy shop by, owned by a Jewish owner. And the toy shop was also vandalized. And she saw toys in the streets and everything and also dolls. And she would say, the dolls are like people. <laughs> it's interesting to know, and it's a, it's a nice, nice ending of the story somehow to, all in these circumstances. My father was 12 years old and he saw the same shop. A couple of hours later, he would see the same thing. So he's from the Christian side. So, and both got married in the 50s and they shared their story with me. So the same day, the same shop, the same experience, but with different backgrounds. And this is something which touched me even today, you see that. My mom survived, otherwise I wouldn't be here. And uh, she, she, she turned 92. And she always remember that day and the 9th of November every year, she would talk about this, if this, what she experienced in front of that shop. So yeah, the background, what, what is Jeremy now doing, doing with the past and how we are commemorating the events of 9th of November, 1938, they, they marked a transition from the discrimination against the Jewish population, which started much earlier, as we all know, into, into subsequent systematic uh, persecution. This is was really kind of turning point. Before they also were discriminated, my Jewish family, they, my, my surviving grandfather told me that it started very early in daily life. What we all learn today and know today are of all the bureaucratic measures and and in inverted commas, the big action actions in inverted commas. But it started my mom telling me when kids saw her on the street, they would they would change the sidewalk. It, it started this by this little in inverted commas things before the so-called Reichskristallnacht. I would always say I say always pogrom myself. And for Jews in Germany, it it became unmistakably clear that they cannot go on as they used to do. And some, even my grandfather told me, I still have a book at home from the Olympics from 1936, owned by my Jewish grandfather, who was proud to see all this, this great games going on. And he was yet, he was yet, he knew what's going on, but yet he had this, this position between uh, horror and still being proud to have the Olympics in Berlin as a Jewish man. So he was, it was for very many Jewish families, including the, the families of my family, a kind of transitory situation. But when the pogrom night happened, for very many people it became clear and some of my family tried to get out of the country as well. And so after, after the, the pogrom night, the, the, the immigration skyrocketed. It was really in a few months, about 200,000 Jewish people left Germany and there was, and the acts were just off of the 9th of November, but just really the, the starting point of the, the most horrible abyss we ever, ever experienced in history, in human history. And after, after liberation, I always say liberation, not capitulation, Germany was liberated by the allies, especially by the United States. And we are still grateful. My family was saved by American soldiers, by the way, the 5th of March, 1945 in Cologne. When Germany, after the war, people tried to forget, very many people tried to say, hey, the Nazis are them and we are they. So they, there was a certain unwillingness in Germany to accept what happened before. And, 
and very many people didn't want to remember. They just wanted to forget to build up a new Germany. And they said, well, you know, it's why shall we bother with that? But it, the, 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 uh, the uh, society changed a lot in the 50s and 60s and 70s. There was suddenly, this, we had the, the trials, uh, 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 the Auschwitz trials in Germany. And there was again a discussion starting in Germany. Suddenly they were exposed to the past of Germany by having the defendants, the Nazi defendants uh, being, being at court and therefore in this, in this context, the discussion started in Germany, but still in more intellectual circles, not really uh, at the roots of society. But then little by little, uh, uh, when we came to the end of the 60s, uh, they, you remember the so-called 68 revolution, whatever that is, but there were very many young people there questioning the past of their parents. Dad, what did you do during this, or grandfather, what did you do during the Second World War? Are you responsible? Were you a victim or were you a perpetrator? Well, and very many young people started to, to discuss that and broadening, bring the issue into the family and saying, I remember that in my family, my family was different. My mother uh, it was a survivor from the Jewish family and from my father's side, they were anti-Nazi. It was a, a Catholic family and they never ever accepted the Nazi horror and they would try to to, to, to do kind of resistance, a daily resistance. My grandfather from the father's side, he was a teacher for German and they didn't allow any more Jewish authors to teach. And so he did Heinrich Heine in saying, it's a very famous unknown German uh, poet. And he would smuggle Heinrich Heine and the lower right, however, in his teaching. He was not a resistance fighter like Stauffenberg, all these great people, but in daily life, he did his thing. So I, I, I had not too much to question. And so uh, then we had, you might remember, uh, the, when, when Chancellor Willy Brandt, when he was visiting 1970 Poland, Warsaw, the, the former Warsaw ghetto, he would uh, drop to his knees. And this was not organized. He did that really out, out of the blue. He was, it was suddenly something drew him to do that. That was a very also one of these turning points in German consciousness, seeing the Chancellor of Germany kneeling in the Warsaw ghetto. This was so important also for, for this making up our minds to start this commemoration process, which is still going on. And then there was an American TV series, Holocaust. I mean, the younger uh, among you might not know it anymore. It was with Mary Streep. She was one of the main characters. And that miniseries would uh, show the life of a German Jewish family uh, 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 who had to go through the Shoah. And this was the moment I recall. I, I was then uh, a youngster, a teenager, but I remember then that in German society, in all families, they started to ask questions, even in schools, they asked teachers. And my father, who was uh, serving in the Ministry for uh, Education, I uh, asked him, Dad, you know, it's what's going on here? Because I knew this, I, from my family, I was involved, so I knew a lot of things. And I was taught by my mom and my grandfather a lot of things, but very many of my class comrades, they didn't know much about it. And my dad said, we just published in our ministry a kind of guidelines for teacher to teach the Holocaust to, to German kids. Imagine, we are talking about the 70s, mid 70s. So there was still a lack of educational knowledge to share with children. I have still these documents at home and it's kind of, kind of strange. And then, but I have to say, then really our, our history books started to be more diligent and more, more explanatory and, and teaching us the backgrounds. And I do remember I was at school, I was 12 years or 11 years old, they asked us to come to the main auditorium. They showed us a documentary on Auschwitz, which was very hard for a 12 year old. But this was the moment we all started with it. It is so important. And you in the United States, who have the education, Holocaust education for so long. And you, are, I'm always uh, touched by, by sentences like people say, Germany is, a, is an example for commemoration. And this is true perhaps. But we had to learn our lessons too. And we had to learn how to teach and how to, to share 
the memory also of survivors with our children or with our grandchildren. And now we have the situation that our government, we have this, for us, the existence of Israel and the survival of the Jewish people is in, within the texture, not only of foreign policy, of our policy as such. It's really like a leitmotif in music. It will, it will ever be our leitmotif. And this is what we call continuity also of German commemoration culture. And everybody, and, and I know we now we are forming a new government, and you can be assured that the new government it comes to to commemoration when it comes to commemorate together or to the policy policy towards Israel, there's a lot of solidarity going on. And our, our outgoing chancellor, Mrs. Merkel, was and is very much devoted to it. She just recently visited Israel for a, on a farewell tour, so to speak. And she would also mention this again, that Germany is so close to Israel and is really uh, always in solidarity. And the good thing about it, it's Israel and Germany are both democratic countries. And I always saying to my friends when they are uh, discussing Israel or criticizing Israel, I always saying, this is the only democratic state in the Middle East. And within Israel, there are so many discussions from the left to the right, in the center, NGOs and discussing the issue. And for us learning, what we, we learn from the Kristallnacht, so-called Kristallnacht, pogrom is, turning point and it was perhaps the 9th of November 1938 some Germans might already have realized what's going on unfortunately there were not enough of them and at that time the the, the citizen we, today we have a kind of we still have extremists here anti-semitism very 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 people who are really uh, narrow-minded but however at this time in the 30s, 40s, this authoritarian, authoritarian attitude of people, not only in Germany, obeying their government, believing everything, and just obeying was a, a culture of obeying is not a culture of liberation. So we had also, Germany have had to learn that lesson after the war. And the installation of democracy in Germany has very much to do with the United States, because the United States gave us a second chance. I mean, for you, it might, you have your values for so many hundreds or two hundreds of years. We had to learn to be taught that we have the same values. We had to learn from you. This is very important. Therefore, I'm always, I'm really proud to be here because uh, to be also invited by the Holocaust Museum of Los Angeles because you are great friends. And what you are doing, and, and, and I see Paul, people who are sharing everything, what they experience with the young people. It's so important. We do that in Germany as well. And you cannot imagine how many people ask questions and youngsters are still asking questions. So you are precious, you guys, you are so precious. And I will sing your song also when I'm going back to Germany one day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan, for sharing um, your perspective, but also a little bit about your family's experience and how this is such a personal history to you. I will now ask the audience, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, please put them in the Q&A box and we will get to them. Um, I will give everyone kind of a, a moment to sort of think of questions to ask. I'm gonna ask a few of my own questions beginning with Dr. Steinweiss. Um, you mentioned in your presentation how from 1933 up till 1938, a lot of the anti-Jewish um, actions that were taking place were more legal based. Um, was more legislation. And this was really one of the first moments if you sort of remove the, the failed April 1933 boycott where there was an eruption of violence. Why do you think um, it took till 1938 for that to happen? And why do you think 1938 was the year in which it happened? Um, uh, in 1936, in February 1936, uh, there was a, uh, an assassination of a German, uh, of a Nazi official in Switzerland by a, uh, a young Jewish man uh, that in many ways was similar to the assassination in Paris on November 7th, 1938, that served as the pretext for the Kristallnacht. And one question that we have to ask is why 
did the Nazi leadership in November 1938 decide to uh, organize violent retaliation uh, against the Jewish community. And why did that happen in 1938 and not 1936? This is going, is using one example to kind of go to your question of why 1938. In 1936, the assassination occurred two days before the start of the Winter Olympics uh, in garmisch partenkirchen in, in uh, Bavaria. And there were many foreign visitors already in Germany. And the, the German government, the, the leadership ordered very emphatically, you know, sent the message down the line that uh, they don't want any retaliation against Jews because it would be bad for Germany's image, right? So that happened in 1936. In 1938, uh, Germany was in a much different position. Uh, the rearmament had uh, proceeded much further. Hitler by November 1938 understood that uh, there was going to be a war. He knew that the European powers would not acquiesce in his expansionistic uh, ambitions and that an, a war would be uh, inevitable. Uh, he believed that it was essential that the uh, remaining Jews in Germany uh, be forced to leave. Uh, Hitler's understanding of why Germany lost, had lost the First World War was very bound up in uh, the anti-Semitic uh, stab in the back legend where he believed that Germany had really won the war militarily but had been betrayed by you know, internal traitors, Jews and communists and so forth. So the, uh, in view of the coming war in 1938, Hitler believed the, the Jews uh, uh, still in the country constituted a kind of a, you know, uh, a national security threat and needed to be removed. In general, in the Nazi leadership, not, not Hitler only, but among many of the leading Nazis and many of their most ardent supporters around the country, by late 1938, there had uh, developed a very high level of frustration that so many Jews were still in the country. There had been an attempt early in the year at the Evian conference to arrange for Jewish emigration, and that was a, a, a failure and so there was a, a, a decision uh, when this assassination occurred that this would be an opportunity to do something drastic to basically uh, move the anti-Semitic campaign to the next level, uh, make life intolerable for the Jews still in Germany and basically you know, scare the hell out of them uh, to send them a message that it wasn't merely that they were going to be humiliated and disenfranchised and so forth, but that they would be in physical danger. And uh, that strategy worked. Uh, as uh, General Consul Schneider mentioned a few moments ago, uh, in, in the immediate aftermath of the Kristallnacht, you had the single largest number of Jews leaving, uh, uh, leaving Germany. So there's a whole kind of like convergence of uh, factors. Thank you. And there's a question from the audience, which I think is a very interesting one, because we oftentimes think of history as happening in the past and maybe not having some of the modern mechanisms like insurance that we have today. Um, and there's a question in the audience about who had to pay for the damage. Were there insurance policies? How were they honored, if at all? Um, and how were, if at all, people compensated and to whom were the payments given? Mm -hmm. Is that question for me? It is, yes. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, 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 the properties that were destroyed were insured, and the German insurance industry, the, 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 there are whole books on this actually, the German uh, insurance industry uh, felt that it had to honor the policies because uh, insurance is a business that relies on the faith that the customers, that the policyholders have in the insurance company. So the German insurance industry was actually very unhappy that this pogrom had occurred. All of this property had been damaged. A lot of the property that was damaged was not owned by Jews. There were shops operated by Jews in buildings owned by non-Jews, right? And it wasn't the Jewish property that was actually the, the contents of the shop was Jewish property, but 
not the you know the display window and the the the, the, the physical structure. So uh, many uh, of the uh, many members of the audience know about this notorious uh, billion Reichmark fine that was imposed on the Jewish community uh, after the Kristallnacht. Uh, and it's usually assumed that the reason for that was to kind of further impoverish the Jews and to humiliate them. And those were reasons as well. But one of the main reasons was basically to reimburse the German insurance companies because they had to pay out on these policies. And Paul, as someone, your parents had a shop. Um, did they ever need to file insurance claims? What did they bear the responsibility of the store following Kristallnacht? Did your parents continue to operate the store after you were on um, a kinder transport? No, the uh, store went into liquidation. My grandmother, who was a legal owner of the store, had to declare bankruptcy because the destruction of merchandise was com complete, but the merchandise still had to be paid. Uh, so there was no reimbursement. And even in subsequent claims for uh, after the war, um, the fact that it was the store was in liquidation was uh, held against us um, and you know there was no nothing no insurance or no other proceeds uh, basically uh, the family was uh, without any ongoing means of support uh, fortunately my father had owned a, an apartment building that he had to sell to primarily meet the his share of the one billion penalty that uh, uh, was mentioned. And with the help of other relatives, the family somehow continu continued its uh, uh, constantly uh, more difficult existence until its uh, final deportation in August of 1942 from Wiesbaden to First Theresienstadt and uh, early 1943 uh, uh, to um, uh, Auschwitz and instant murder upon arrival. Uh, one comment uh, that uh, about Dr. Steinweiss, uh, I'm sorry, about the Consul General reaction of Germany. I spoke in, over the years quite often in Germany too. And I always welcomed to students, including at the school where I was a student in Wiesbaden. As recently as two years ago, I spoke there and at other, several other schools. And I'm, uh, for the last 30 years I've been doing this, both here and in Germany. And I am impressed with the uh, interest and uh, reception I every time get by German students. And I even get questions sometimes on the searching, one of them being German students asking me, are we guilty? Well, how do I answer that? You are not guilty what happened during the lifetime of your grandparents or more likely your great grandparents. But you have an obligation to know the history of your country, to make sure that it doesn't happen again, that you protect the freedom and well being that you currently enjoy, protect the democracy, and fight uh, any discrimination, any anti-Semitism, and preserve what you have now, but don't forget what happened in those terrible years 
in the early 1940s and late 30s. Paul, there are a few questions in the audience about your family and you shared ultimately what happened to your parents. How did you find out um, what happened to your parents, your grandmother, your cousin in Berlin? One thing that functions extremely well was postal connections between Germany and Sweden. Sweden being a neutral country. How did I stay in contact with my family? Well, in those days, our means of communication were not what we have today. We wrote letters. I got letters every week. I wrote letters every week. We also knew in Sweden, I was in 1942, actually working in the Jewish community in Stockholm. We learned what was happening to Jews in Poland. We learned when the German, when the deportations of Jews in Germany commenced in late 41. And we knew that uh, the uh, ultimate outcome was we had to expect the worst. Anyhow, as in August of 1942, my parents wrote to me, we have to leave, we may go to Theresienstadt, we don't know if we can stay in, in contact with you. Well, I wrote cards from Sweden, registered with return receipts, to each of my parents, to my grandmother, to a Theresienstadt, just to make sure I would know where they were. Within days, I got their signature back. I could write letters to them. They were allowed to write letters, very limited, six lines. I got a couple of letters from them. But then in January of 1943, in Yes, after they had been, in, my, my parents had been in Theresienstadt for five months. My letters to them came back with a big stamp marked abgereist, meaning no longer here. Uh, at uh, address, uh, current address of uh, the party to whom this is addressed, unknown. But I knew this was bad news. This, uh, we, learned that Theresienstadt in many ways was a transit camp uh, where Jews were gathered for ultimate uh, transport to um, Auschwitz and other extermination camps. I also had my grandmother who stayed on in Theresienstadt for another year before she died there. I could send little packages. She could send acknowledgement for each uh, package that she got. Uh, so the there, the mail functioned very well. Another instance was my friend Leo, who was had gone to Holland when I came to Sweden. His sister, who was doing slave labor in Berlin before her final deportation, wrote to me. Could I write to her brother? Maybe this mail from Sweden would get through. His address was labor camp, Birkenau near Auschwitz. I wrote, well, Leo did not get that card. I doubt that he probably by that time was not alive anymore. But anyhow, again, my card came back with a stamp Concentration camp refuses acceptance of mail. So as I said before, mail with a neutral country was kept going when everything else failed. I learned later that 
from records that were kept in Theresienstadt and uh, records of what happened to transports from there to Auschwitz that in, when my parents were sent from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz that the whole transport on arrival instantly was to the gas chambers. The death of my grandmother in Theresienstadt was communicated to me by other friends or relatives in Theresienstadt, again by mail. And overall, being in a neutral country and having contacts, both legal and illegal, kept us well informed what was happening long before uh, the concentration camps were liberated. Stefan, as someone with a personal experience um, such as yours, did you find that growing up in Germany, you felt a responsibility to share your family's story? And how do you think that your family's experience shaped the work that you do today? Um, at the beginning, I didn't know anything about it because my surviving grandfather didn't want to share his story with us because he was afraid that we would feel guilty or unease, whatever. I don't know. He was a very sweet man. He didn't want to impose himself, which is in my personal point of view, with all due respect, he did not impose himself. So, but, but uh, we found out when we had the, uh, the horrible attack on the Israeli team in Munich at the Olympics, my mother was so upset. She was so upset that we just, we kids ask her, see what's going on. We were also shocked. But my mother was shocked in a way which was different. And then she really, she would somehow not, not, not uh, abide to what she promised to her father and she would tell us a story. And then uh, it was always like when I was, I was saying, I have, we have to, to do something against all these Nazis around because at that time in the, in the early seventies, there was still this old generation uh, around and we never know who was involved or not. And as a child, you might not be just, but as a child to say, this can be one, this can be one, whatever. And it was not so easy. And my mom told me, but don't talk too much about it. And I said, mom, I mean, we have to really, because that's, uh, it's, uh, it's important. But then she told me a couple of years later, she was in a cafe in Dusseldorf where I lived, where we lived. And there was uh, visitors from Israel, former uh, citizens of Dusseldorf, who came back to Germany. We have programs even today in Germany to invite former Jewish citizens of cities to come back and to, 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 to share their stories. Of, of course, uh, time goes by and there are not there very, very many people being still able to tell their stories. And she was sitting in a cafe, my mom. And they, I mean, we all know what is, what is a Jewish looking like, you know, all this prejudice. But these ladies looked just Oriental. They had all this, this wonderful Mediterranean uh, jewelry on and uh, they could be Greek or Turkish or whatever. But for some reasons, somebody said in German, Da sind sie ja schon wieder. They are back again. And my mom said to me, here you see, she would just, you know, pay, pay the bill and would just run away. So it is not so easy to, to and then I grew up and I, we learned a lot in school. And I saw a question here in, from the audience, what is written in the German uh, history books. And we have a lot of uh, very diligent history books with documentary, with speeches of, of, the, of the Nazis and everything. And also we have uh, meetings with survivors and also as pupils. But anyway, and then later in the years, I, uh, I joined the Foreign Service um, with hesitation. I may say that after 35 years of service, and I really asked my mom for permission because she always said to me, I like Germany, I'm born in Germany, but I do not love Germany. So it is, uh, for me, it was a double-edged sword and I, and by my, my mom, although being a Christian lady at the end, she, would, she was a Yiddish mama in all her attitude. So I knew if I asked her just simply, may I do it? She would say, of course, my dear, go for it. So I, I used kind of tricky thing to try to, a little bit to trick her out, whatever. And then she said, wow, that's great. We are going to travel. That's fantastic. Dad and I were looking forward to, be, to you being a diplomat. 
but it was really a decision for me uh, and the older I get, the more experience I have in my profession. It's still, I'm convinced it is right to, 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 to represent my country abroad, but the same token is with bitterness sometimes, I have to say that, frankly speaking, because the impact of my family's history is this. But I think I should, because Germany has also a great culture. Germany is, is not the, just the abyss we experienced, the world experienced uh, uh, during the Nazi time. Germany has also another side. But I'm still kind of, and I'm very frank to you now, never said that in public. It is, it, I do it with pride, but with a certain bitterness in my heart. Thank you. And I know that we are sort of over time, so I might ask just one or two more questions. Um, the final one for you, Alan, there's a question in the audience about how if this, um, if, if Kristallnacht, the November pogrom, was seen as such a point of no return for Marini, German, and Austrian Jews, how did you throughout the rest of Europe react? What was the international reaction and response to hearing about um, the, this, this November pogrom? Well, obviously the Jews of the rest of Europe were horrified. Uh, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, they could necessarily do anything about it or go anywhere, right? Uh, obviously uh, uh, in, uh, in, um, in it, the, the Jewish response was also very different by country. For example, uh, in France, uh, because the assassination of the German diplomat that had served as the uh, pretext for the violence happened in France uh, the, uh, at, at a time that was a fairly kind of sensitive, uh, it was a sensitive period of diplomacy between France and Germany in the weeks after the, uh, the Munich Pact, you know, that was just a few weeks earlier. And uh, uh, the, the Jewish assassin, uh, Herschel Grunspan, uh, was actually uh, not, uh, the, the, the French Jewish community distanced themselves from him and they, they, they didn't uh, approve of, uh, of what had happened. But obviously they were horrified like Jews everywhere uh, and not only Jews, uh, but uh, horrified by the violence in the United States, and you know, there are there's a lot of scholarship done available on the uh, American response to the Kristallnacht. Uh, there was a you know an uh, an outpouring of uh, indig indignation. Uh, rabbis were invited to speak from the pulpits of Christian churches. Uh, the, uh, the the newspapers were full of. Uh, you know, uh, very strongly worded, worded editorial. The official response uh, took two forms. One, uh, the American ambassador was withdrawn from uh, Berlin. They, the, we didn't break diplomatic relations, but we withdrew the ambassador. It's what, what the French did recently over the submarines, right? That's considered to be a very serious uh, 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 diplomatic uh, gesture. And in fact, it was only uh, in 1949 uh, or maybe 48 that uh, an American ambassador was sent back uh, to, uh, to Germany. Uh, and also, uh, uh, you know, as is well known, uh, uh, the, uh, there was a lot of opposition in the American Congress and elsewhere in American society to, uh, um, uh, relaxing the quotas, the immigration quotas, or even meeting the immigration quotas, actually, uh, on uh, for German Jews. Uh, uh, and, but uh, uh, President Roosevelt uh, issued an executive order uh, extending the uh, temporary visas of German Jews who were in the United States, you know, only temporarily. Uh, and they were allowed to stay, and many of them, you know, ended up staying long term, and uh, therefore that it, the executive order sa saved, uh, you know, several thousand, uh, several thousand lives. 
uh, you know, one could spend a lot of time talking about the response in Poland and the Soviet Union and so forth. And there's been a lot of work, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any uh, episode in the history of Nazi Germany that has been written about as much or more uh, than, than this particular one. And when you dig deep, you know, you can find, you know, entire books devoted to, you know, the response of European countries to Kristallnacht. I myself am a, a, a contributor to a book about the Canadian response uh, to the Kristallnacht. A lot of it involves, you know, uh, debates in the various countries over uh, the question of uh, admitting more Jewish uh, refugees. Um, and for one of our final questions, Paul, I, I know that this synagogue in your town, in your home city, um, was destroyed shortly before your bar mitzvah. Were you able to have a bar mitzvah? Did this impact your Jewish identity at all, your experience during Kristallnacht and as a survivor? I could have, my bar mitzvah was scheduled for December 31st. And there was a uh, uh, informal uh, hall where it could have taken place. But I also knew that I could become by mitzvah at the Jewish school where I uh, moved to in Sweden. I was not inclined to become by mitzvah anymore in Germany under such sad and uh, depressing conditions. I did become by mitzvah in Sweden four months later among my comrades and other kids, we were 60 students at that school. They became family to us. I spent a lifetime in contact with them. My Jewish attitude, I'm not a religious Jew, I'm a, but we always kept the holidays and I'm highly supportive of Jewish organizations, both here and in Israel, including the Holocaust Museum. And having seen the destruction, even though from new to Sweden, of the Jewish life and Jewish institutions in Europe, it is my purpose besides speaking of what happened but to actively support them in this country, especially organizations that fight anti-Semitism. I'm a trustee of a foundation whose purpose is exactly that. So being Jewish is part of my life and has been, and probably much more so than it would have been under normal conditions, would I have been just an assimilated Jew in Germany? Thank you. And thank you everyone for your patience as this riveting conversation went a little over our, our allotted time. On behalf of Holocaust Museum LA, thank you Paul, Allen, and Stefan for sharing your time, your insights with us today. We dedicate this program to all the victims of Kristallnacht and to the 6 million Jews who were ultimately murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators because of who they were. Hearing survivor testimony like we heard tonight is so important for our community and becoming increasingly precious. Just last week, the community of Louisville, Kentucky lost Vila Gladstein, someone who dedicated her life to educating others about the Holocaust. May her memory be a blessing and also inspire us all to continue her legacy of Holocaust education. You can hear more testimony from survivors on our website, our YouTube page, or in future public programs. Um, in fact, please join us again this Thursday at 12 p.m. for a special Veterans Day talk with veteran and Dachau camp liberator Don Greenbaum. You can also join us next week on Wednesday, November 17th at 11 a.m. for the next program in our Sephardic Mizrahi story series, Surviving the Farhood, the Holocaust in Iraq. Joseph Samuels will share his family's story of survival, his subsequent escape from Iraq, and the history of Mizrahi Jews. 
You can find more information about our virtual events on our website, holocaustmuseumla.org. Also, a recording of this program will be available on Holocaust Museum LA's YouTube channel. Holocaust Museum LA brings you programs like today's at no charge. If you are enjoying our programs, please consider supporting our work by becoming a member. Thank you again, Paul, Alan, and Stefan, and the German Consulate General uh, and the German Consulate General in Los Angeles, and to all of you for joining us today. Take care, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you.